Hey everyone, Draco Magnus here for another bonus episode of Let's Play Nine Person Nine Nine Persons Nine Hours Nine Doors. In the last episode, we went through the opposite door of what we did in our first playthrough, and uh, we did it. We got out to this hallway again. This time, we're the first ones here. Uh, a couple things before we uh, get like totally started. You might hear a humming in the background. I'm not sure how powerful the blue is and if it'll pick it up, but I have the fan on in the background. The reason being, it's kinda hot where I'm recording right now, and I am willing to leave the fan on. If it's like too big of an issue, then I will turn it off, but I don't think it's gonna be like that noticeable, or if it is, like I said, I'll turn it off. The other thing, I'm not entirely sure if these are bonus episodes or not. Because I thought about it, and since I'm going to be doing multiple endings here, and this playthrough is a lot longer than I expected it to be, well, I mean, it's kind of obvious why I'm not sure if they're bonus episodes anymore. Um, I might change the name, but I'll still introduce them as bonus episodes, even though they might not be. But with that out of the way... The iron gate still stood in place, locked tight, blocking the stairway. In the center of the gate was the keyhole engraved with the Venus symbol. This time, however, Junpei had the Venus key in his pocket. Wasting no time, sorry, wasting no time, he pulled it out and shoved it into the keyhole. Violently, then he pulled it out, then put it back in again, then pulled it out again. For no particular reason. Oh, never mind. He turned it. With the distinct sound of metal on metal, he felt the lock click open. Alright, let's get this thing open. No problem. Let me help with this one. Junpei grabbed the handle on the left side, and Seven took the handle on the right. On Junpei's signal, they both pushed, and the gate creaked open. Yet for some reason, they weren't in front of us. The door is just sort of magically opened. And they pushed from outside of camera view. I, mean, I suppose that would have been a bit of work to animate them pushing the doors open. And this is mostly text-based to give it a sort of imagination effect, where you imagine the horrible things you see reading. But I digress! It sounds as though you've opened it. We should be able to reach the sea deck now, I imagine. Snake, are you gonna be alright? I mean, the stairs. Please, do not do yourself the embarrassment of underestimating me. I... would be unlikely to trip, even if I were running backwards. Good to hear, let's move. At Seven's words, they leapt onto the stairs, jogging quickly down them. In no time at all, they found themselves on the sea deck. You know, just throwing it out there, there's nothing people that, like, have some sort of problem dislike more than people underestimating their skills at movement and functioning. That's just a given. I mean, I understand the concern, because he's blind, but he's seen him move around without any help. Why would he think he'd have difficulty with stairs? Wow, I keep going off on tangents, don't I? Junpei ran down the stairs a little farther, in hopes of checking on the deck below. When he reached the water, he called back up to Snake and Seven. Just what I thought. D-Deck is completely underwater. Just like the bottom of the central staircase. The surface of the water below them was flat, like a mirror. That it had not changed too greatly since they'd last seen it was a great relief. Junpei quickly retraced his steps and headed back to Sea deck In front of the stairs were a pair of elevators. They appeared to be identical to the ones from the upper floor. Between them, attached to the wall, was another card reader. And next to that was another strange symbol. Hey, check it out! It's the symbol for Lotus! Ha! <laughs> what? See? It's got the woman's symbol, and then it's got devil horns, right? <laughs> yeah, I see it. No two ways about it. That was a pretty good one, kid. Seven tousled Junpei's hair 
in what he likely thought to be a friendly manner. Junpei feared his neck might break, even though it was clear Seven had kept his strength in check. Thankfully, Snake interrupted. After Junpei's observation, he'd gone over to examine the card reader. This is a Mercury symbol. The marks you mistook for horns are the stylized version of the wing and staff of Hermes. Oh, I get it. The wings are the top, and then the staff is the bottom part. But that's weird. It looks like he has a staff between his legs. You know what? I'm not going to question it. Greek mythology. Although I suppose since it's Mercury, it'd technically be Roman mythology? Whatever. Wings and a staff, huh? So she beats you with the staff until you die and go to heaven? Sounds like Lotus, all right. <laughs> Seven shook Junpei's head with even more, even more vigorously, and the young man began to feel as though his brain was being jostled about inside of his skull. He began to feel rather ill. Unless we can activate this device, I doubt the elevator will function. In other words, we gotta find a key card with a Mercury symbol on it. So I would assume. They decided to leave the elevators alone for the time being, and headed back to the stairs. Wow, that's a lot funnier, with Lotus not there. To the left was another hallway, because then they can elaborate on it. There were a great many doors lining both sides of the hallway. They seemed to stretch on forever, and all three men suddenly felt very small. Aw, oh, shit. We're not going to have enough time to check all of these, are we? Maybe we can come back here later. Let's check out the other side. They turned around and went back the way they came. Or come, rather. To the right of the stairs, another hallway stretched out, reaching deep into the bowels of the ship. After a few moments of briskly moving down the hallway, they emerged into an area roughly the same size and shape as the other one at the top of the stairs. On the left side of the room were four French doors. Well, let's open them. Junpei nodded and grabbed one closest to him. He gave it a small tug and felt it move. It was unlocked. Thrilled to have found another unlocked door, he threw it open. Isn't it amazing what thrills you when you have so little? I mean, just having a door unlocked- OH MY GOD YES AN UNLOCKED DOOR! WE HAVE AN OPTION! Junpei didn't know what to make of what he saw. Except we do, because we've seen this already. Hospital room. Which reminds me... He simply stood, unable to speak. There we go, now I have this scroll to the correct area. I want to go through... Okay. I think he went through that door last time. Uh, did I read that? Yes, he simply stood unable to speak. Seven's eyes opened wide and his mouth gaped. After a few long moments, Seven at last managed to speak. Hey, what, what is this place? A massive room stretched out in front of them, more a cavern than a room. Its vastness was oppressive and bore down on Seven and Junpei. It was not empty, however. The entire room was filled with lines upon lines of beds. They were simple things, little more than pipe and thin mattress. Says, rather, is this a hospital? He had at last been able to put a name to the harsh scent that pervaded the room. The room was full of the clean smell of antiseptic solution. In the center of the room were shelves stacked with medicine, and a number of medical devices, the function of which Junpei did not know. More importantly, however, on the back wall of the room were four doors. Three of them were emblazoned with large single-digit numbers made with thick red blood, I mean paint. The door on the left was labeled three. The second door on the left had no number, but the third had been given a seven. The door on the right bore an 8. There could be no doubt, they were the number doors. I added a the, but whatever. It did strike Junpei as strange, however, that the door between 3 and 7 should be blank. What, he wondered, could it mean? Let's take a look at those doors. Yeah, good idea. 
The three of them threaded their way through the beds toward the back of the room. Upon reaching them, they proceeded to investigate each door in turn, but to no avail. Oh, they tried the blank door. Hmm. Yep, locked. Just like I thought. Possibly jammed and maybe stuck. Naturally. After all, there are rules to the nonary game. And to allow these doors to open easily would violate those rules. Unless we can authenticate ourselves with a red, the numbered doors will... Whoa, whoa, check this out! Suddenly, Seven spoke up, interrupting Snake. Look at the red. There's nothing on it. Well, to be fair, he can't look at it. Huh? I guess he was speaking more to Junpei. Don't you remember the red back at the main staircase? There wasn't anyone in it. It said vacant on the little screen, remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. But this one... There's nothing. Right? You think it's broken? Only one way to find out. <laughs> Junpei and the others put their hands on the panel, but nothing happened. The red refused to change. They tried pulling the lever, and still nothing. As soon as they discovered it was only the red on door 8 that seemed to be malfunctioning, the red on door 7, and the red on door 3, none of them worked. Oh, it wasn't only. My mistake. What they wondered did it mean? They've got to be broken. Man, that bastard. I didn't think Zero was the kind of guy who'd screw around with something like this. Whoa, whoa. Zero's been prepared for everything so far. And you're saying he's gonna make a mistake now? Well, that's the only thing I can think of. This thing ain't working at all. While Junpei and Seven talked, Snake busied himself with examining the red. After a time, he lowered his hands and spoke. It seems as if some of the internal hardware has been removed. Internal hardware? That's what I said. Take a look at the underside of this red, if you please. Junpei obliged and bent down to look at the underside of the device. A long, thin slit ran across the bottom of it. As he looked harder, he realized it was more of a slot than a slit, and that it was clearly meant to be to accommodate some manner of electronical device. The other two reds were the same. Something had clearly been removed from all three of them. I get it. So the reds aren't working because somebody pulled... Damn it, my laptop is dying. I have to go down and get the charger. The reds aren't working because someone pulled out their guts. So I assume. But why? And who? I mean, it doesn't really make any sense. Or make sense. I added in any. I have no idea. What do you mean you have no idea? You guys are the first people here aside from Zero. Therefore, logic would dictate the person who removed them is Zero. It might not make sense, but that is the case. Why on earth would I know something like that? Just then... They heard the sound of a door opening. The three of them turned and saw... Akane! Oh no, Junpei thought, it's... June! She stopped short, surprised to see them, and was very nearly bowled over by the rest of her companions, who were coming through the door behind her. Ace, Santa, Clover, and Lotus all poured out of the door, each of them as surprised as the last to see Junpei, Snake, and Seven. Junpei and Seven were, for the moment, at a loss for words. What are you guys doing? Why are you...
After a moment of silence and surprise, everybody suddenly began to talk, desperate to exchange information. They talked about the rooms they'd been through and how they'd ended up in the same place. Of course, none of it was very useful information, but that hardly mattered. They were happy to simply see one another again. Although the level of cheer varied greatly from person to person, each one of them was wearing some manner of smile, almost as though they had already forgotten about the death of the ninth man. No, thought Junpei, perhaps that wasn't it. Perhaps thoughts of his death were what drove them to smile at one another. Not in a morbid or hateful way, no. The ninth man had died. But they were still alive, and that was something to be happy about. A sort of simple, uncomplicated joy, Junpei thought. The joy of being alive. Still alive. He felt sorry for the ninth man, but more than anything, Junpei was just happy to be alive. I know technically we've seen that cutscene already, but I wanted to include it just for story progression's sake. It'd be awkward to cut there. This is bad, though. And there might be some new stuff. If the red isn't working, we can't keep going. What about that big hallway? Maybe there's somewhere in there we might be able to go. No, there's nothing there. The five of us had a quick look. There were a great many rooms, although none of them appeared to have held any patience for quite some time. Patience? You mean all those doors are ho for hospital rooms? Yes. Apparently, they had a... They have a number of individual rooms in addition to this large central room. There was a door down at the end of the hallway too, but it was locked. It had one of those solar system mark things on it. It was the Jupiter symbol. Jupiter? I wonder what it means. Confusion seemed to be the consensus. That reminds me, what's the deal with this big room anyway? What is this thing? Was this some kind of huge passenger ship? No one, not even Snake, appeared ready to offer an answer until Seven unexpectedly spoke up. I bet it's a hospital ship. In fact, it's probably the Gigantic. The Gigantic? Okay, this is something we've already known about, so we're just going to skip past this. And I'm going to cut this here for obvious reasons until something new happens. See you in a bit. Hey, I'm back. Apparently, it's not letting me speed through this, so I'm guessing there's some slightly new dialogue here. So we're gonna keep this. Junpei looked at Seven, shocked by both his knowledge and the apparent identity of their prison. He was not the only one. What's the gigantic? Seven nodded to Lotus and began to speak. The gigantic... He explained that she had been the sister ship to the Titanic, built in the early early 20th century. Nope, still not letting me fast forward through this. The Titanic had two sister ships, were identical to one another in nearly every aspect. The Gigantic was said to be one of them. She was initially intended to be a passenger liner like the Titanic, but soon after the ship was launched, the First World War began, and she was pressed into duty by the British Navy as a hospital ship. Actually, you know what? I am going to cut this here. Because though th I think that line before it was new, this is not. So I'll be right back. Until something new. I figured I'd include this part too, because now that we know about his memory, the scene will change slightly, in theory. I guess your memory isn't back yet. No, sorry. Then, almost as if to save Seven from further embarrassment... A bell began to ring from far away. It sounded as though it was the clock at the main stairway. Junpei counted each chime carefully. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. It's midnight.
Then we've still got six hours left, right? Then let's just get moving. We gotta find that hardware the reds are missing. That's all well and good, but where are we going to look? Well, we've already searched this big patient room. They've been examining the room as they talked, but we haven't found anything. Right. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Just one? Uh, well, not just one. Question mark? Wait a minute! Are you telling me we have to search all of these rooms? Well, you already checked some of them before you came here, right? We each checked a single room, so... Five rooms in total. Alright then, that's five rooms we don't have to search. If we split up, it won't be that bad. If each of us can do six rooms apiece, we'll have the other 48 rooms cleared in no time. There are 48 rooms? Lutz did not seem excited by the prospect. Seven fidgeted nervously before responding. Uh, maybe. 